Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Mostly Photo is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Mostly Photo with Lisa Bettany and Leo Laporte. Episode 1, recorded March 22nd, 2011. Low Light. Mostly Photo is brought to you by Ford and the 100% reinvented 2011 Ford Explorer. For more information and information about our photo walks, visit MostlyPhotoAdventures.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Mostly Photo show. With Mostly Lisa. With and most I'm kind of partly Leo. <laughs> hey, this is fun. I'm excited. We're going to do, what, low-light photography? Today we're going to talk about sort of a common problem that a lot of sort of beginner photographers have that is shooting in low light. So if you're shooting in, you know, a dimly lit room, you're at a wedding and it's in a dark restaurant, or, um, you know, anything where, where you're not shade outside. Well, that's the funny thing. People don't think of a room that we're, you know, birth, like, blowing out candles on a birthday cake. They don't yeah. really think of it as low light because you can see perfectly well, but mm -hmm. your camera can. Exactly. So that's a situation where a lot of beginners have a lot of problems and you see a lot of underexposed shots, a lot of noisy shots. What's noise? Noise. How does that show up? Sh noise shows up as sort of pixelation on your photos. It kind of looks grainy. It, yeah, it looks grainy yeah. and it's a lot of people um, find that to be a problem. And I just want to give you some general tips on how to help solve these problems. All right, low light photography. Low light photography. So the easiest thing you can do is increase your ISO. Okay, I'm going to do this on my camera. <laughs> I should have brought, well, you have the S95. I bet we could do it on, can we I do it do, on here? Yeah. So ISO, it refers to the film speed. So if you remember on old film cameras, you'd actually have to physically change the film if you wanted to change your ISO from, say, 400 to 800. They used to, to really confuse you, in the old days of film, call it ASA. ASA, right. Same thing, though, right? Same thing. So now, obviously, digital cameras don't use film. They use image sensors. And the ISO denotes how sensitive the image sensor is to the amount of light present. So you can see on this S95, it says ISO 125. That's the same as ASA 125. That's pretty well, slow, it, right? Well, it's not, it's not one for one, but it sort of approximates what it would okay. be like. Um, so obviously, the higher the ISO, the greater the image um, sensor is and the greater the possibility it is to take pictures in low light. So if you're shooting at ISO 100 in a dark room, it's going to be dark. So in this camera, I can change the ISO by going into the menu. Mm -hmm. and turning it up. Right, so if you're, if you're on, you know, a DSLR, you know, it's, it's, you know, I have a button here that says ISO, so I can, you know, if I'm all of a sudden going from outdoors to indoors and I'm shooting at ISO 100, I might want to increase that to ISO 400 or ISO 800. Can you go too high? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, this has gone all the way up to 3200, which is the max this camera can do. Right. And obviously the downside of shooting at a high ISO is the increase of noise. So okay. That's when you get more grain. So the more sensitive the image sensor is, the more that it can pick up um, noise. So your images will appear sort of pixelated and, and noisy. I notice you have your camera set to ISO 125, not auto. Is that because you like to shoot 125 generally? Um, I like to shoot as low as you can, you can go. possibly yeah. go. I usually shoot at ISO 100, whether I'm shooting in low light or not. Here's an interesting uh, tip, though, <laughs> on digital cameras. Yeah. S oftentimes, the lowest ISO is not the best ISO on a digital camera. Sometimes going it up a, a little notch, and it, you can actually mm -hmm. look at reviews or measurements of your own There camera. definitely is a sweet spot, and, yeah. and that's something that you might want to do um, for your camera is just Google Learn that. It. Learn it. Try to find what y the, the best possible place to shoot at to get the sharpest and clearest image because that's really what we're shooting for. Right. You must have done that because you set this to 125 even though it goes down to 80. So yeah, you must know. yeah. Yeah. I, I really think, feel with, with point and shoots that do go down to ISO 80, it's, it's not. It's too low. Yeah, it's too low. It's not going to be the best. Um, 
So learn the limits of your camera. And obviously, when you're shooting with, say, you know, a, a Rebel, a Canon Rebel, one of the entry-level DSLRs, you'll learn that you can't really go above ISO 400 without getting a lot of noise. Now, obviously, you know, something like a 5D Mark II is, is built for low light. So, you know, you can go up to ISO 6400 without, you know, having the same problem. So, learning the limits of the, the camera that you have, and you can do this just by testing. And really, take some shots. yeah, take some shots, and, and you'll really notice a difference. Um, I have to say, I, s I sure prefer turning up the sensitivity and getting a little bit of grain to turning on the flash. I just hate flash. Yeah, we're, well, we're going to talk. Especially on point and shoots. Yeah, we're yeah. going to talk a, a bit about that. Um, so, just briefly to reiterate, obviously, you increase the ISO, you get brighter images, but the downfall is that you get noise. Now, another way that you can um, get brighter images in, in low light situations is by decreasing the aperture. So here's, a, here's a wide aperture lens, and if you open it oh, up that's, yeah. as wide as you can go, you're letting more light in. That's a lower, this is what's confusing to me because it's a yeah. ratio. It's a lower number, so it's 1 over 1.2, mm -hmm. 1 over 8. 1 over 8 is smaller yeah. than 1 over 1.2. So yeah, an a, 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 a f8 is actually a smaller, smaller yeah. even though it's a bigger number, a smaller hole in here. So I think... A, a Bigger is more light. So obviously. yeah, something, um, you know, if you're shooting in auto when you first get a DSLR, it tends to always sort of shoot at um, 5. f5.6 it puts or it right f8. puts right in the middle. It's usually yeah, what it does. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And if you want to get really nice um, shallow depth of field shots, which we, we were talking about last week, you really have to decrease your aperture. And, you know, with some um, lenses, you can go really low. And... You get more light. And you get more light. So that's another way that you can sort of get more light into your photos. And obviously, some lenses don't go down that low. So it might, if you're planning on shooting a lot of events or, you know, a lot of um, these types of shots, maybe you might want to consider getting something like the 50-1.8 um, or the 51 4 A faster lens that can let faster light. faster lens. And then you can shoot at those... Um, you know, those low f-stops. But obviously the drawback about this is when you have such a shallow depth of field, you really have to get your focus right on right. the money or else you're going to get a blurry, out-of-focus shot. There's another way to let more light in, and that's to slow your shutter speed down. Right. A time exposure. But then if you've got anything moving, it's all blurry, right? Yeah, so when you're dealing with an increased shutter speed and you, you're not on a tripod, you're not leaning up against something, there's sort of a rule of thumb, and that is that you can't go lower than, like, whatever your number, your uh, lens is, so whether it's a 50, you don't want to go lower than 1 50th. So take your focal length, let's say your 50-millimeter mm -hmm. lens, inverse it, mm -hmm. 1 50th, that's the fastest you can do. Yeah, and I handheld. That's and that I, I actually go lower than that. I cut it in do half. Do you? Yeah, you must I say. Be really steady. I say one, Yeah, if you can really hold it steady, one twenty fifth is actually really. Yeah, but the problem is, you put on a long lens. We've got a somewhere. I got a two hundred millimeter lens. Oh, um, obviously, even that you can't go below one one hundredth, mm -hmm. and you would say one two hundredth to yeah. to, to, not, to avoid blur. I and I if people are moving, forget it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my personal, I, I used to shoot concerts, and yeah, when I shot sense. concerts, I shot with uh, a 50 millimeter, and I found that I couldn't go lower than 180th. Right. Because, you know, you'd have people bumping you. Right. But obviously, there's a lot of different techniques you can do to um, sort of increase your stability. You can, you know, lean up against a wall or... Hold it really tight. Actually, with your strap, you can sort of, like, wind it around. Right. Have you ever done that yeah. strap technique yeah. where you, like, wind it around your arm? It's just really firm, and you put your elbows in to ha let your body... And, you know, Chris Markbart told me a great trick, which is to get a string... It's like a poor man's tripod, and you stand on the string mm -hmm. and hold this tight, and it'll actually yeah. give you a little bit more stability. But even that, you know, if you get it, if you if you've got your shutter speed uh, too slow, it's going to be very hard to get a, a so clean picture. There's nothing worse than having a great shot. You know, it was a great shot, and then you get it's it back, a little bit and blurry, a little motion blur in it. I mean, that's like the that. goal is to get sort of what they call like tack sharp right. images, right. and. Um, you know, really, if you are shooting at longer shutter speeds, you really need to get yourself a tripod. 
And I know tripods are not fun to carry with you, and obviously there are certain situations like at a concert, you know, in some museums where, you know, I've gotten in trouble. I've been kicked out of many venues for having a tripod. So, you know, there are different options. You can go to something like a monopod. I don't know if you've ever used I brought one with me because I'm going to show you my kit, what I bring along. Right. So a monopod is something that is, is portable and you can, you know, you can get a lot more... There's a monopod. Yeah, a lot, yeah. A lot more um, possibilities. But, you know, in something like a gorilla pod, that's a lot more... Oh. I just happened to have brought this all with me. <laughs> well, later I'm going to show you what I do in low light yeah, situations. Yeah, exactly. And of course, your suggestions are exactly what I use. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, you know, and once you've sort of tried all those things, so you've increased your ISO, you've decreased your aperture, you've decreased your shutter speed, and, you know, if you don't have a tripod, you're going to have to go to flash. And like you were saying before, on-camera flash has you know, a lot of issues. You can get hot spots on people's faces. Well, it's, you can it's so close to the lens that it's, it's, it's bouncing right into the lens. You know, and you, you get red eye, right. you get, um, you know, blown out images. And really to, to combat that, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, if you happen to have sort of, um, you know, an actual flash, there are built-in diffusers. And a diffuser is just going to spread the light. So instead of having the light directed right at you, it's going to spread that light so that it's a lot softer and more diffuse. People also will aim their flash at the ceilings, do something called a bounce flash. The exactly. problem really is that if the flash is close to the lens, if you draw a line from the flash to the person and then to the lens, the closer it is to the lens, the more directly that flash is bouncing right into the lens. That's why you get those harsh shots. If right. you tilt this up, it will light the room. It'll be a softer light. Of course, you have to have a more powerful flash. But right. then it's not bouncing right into the lens. Right. So that, you know, there's two things you can do. One is to bounce the light. Mm -hmm. And you can bounce it against any sort of any surface that's surrounding your subject. So, you know, a nice white ceiling, a nice white wall. So you can obviously point it up. You can point it to the side. Just anywhere other than, like, directly at your subject. We talked last week about taking your flash off and using timers and right. so forth to get side light and more important. That's a that's an <laughs> another ball of wax, but if you're if you're just, you know, starting and especially if you're shooting at an event, a lot of people start shooting at weddings, at birthday parties, right. at that kind of thing and, you know, you want something really portable. So if you are shooting with, you know, your point and shoot, there there's not a lot of options on how you can... You can't bounce that flash. Yeah, you can't bounce <laughs> this flash. So I wanted to do um, a DIY today on how you can just use everyday items to create your own diffuser. This is great. This is one of the first things I ever saw you do on your Mostly Lisa site. I know. And I just love this project. <laughs> Let's take a break. I'm going to talk a little bit about our sponsor, and then when we come back... Project time. I've cleared the decks. You've All right, we're ready. <laughs> this uh, show brought to you by our great friends at Ford. They are a great sponsor. When they heard we were going to do a photo show with Lisa, they jumped at the chance, and we're thrilled because they wanted to talk about the 2011 completely redesigned Ford Explorer, perfect for your adventures with the family, on the road, off-road, and with your camera. In fact, we're going to send you out on the road with a Ford I know, Explorer I'm pretty looking soon. forward to the it. The exterior, if you take a look at it, it's clean, it's modern, it looks both refined and rugged at the same time. I think it's just a great looking Ford, 100% reinvented. Interior, of course, is gorgeous, a place that you and your family will love to spend time. You can tell Ford's given a lot of attention to the detail in here and exceptional craftsmanship and everything you see. I actually, it's funny, you know, it's a, a car is about the engine and about getting somewhere, but I love it to be comfortable inside. I love mm -hmm. to feel like I'm traveling in style, and you'll really feel that in the Ford Explorer. Lots of room, too, for yourself, great seating space, but lots of cargo space for you and your passengers and all your adventure gear. Three rows of seats, room up to seven, a large cargo capacity. The second and the third rows of seats will float back, uh, f uh, fold back, rather, uh, to give you 80.7 uh, cubic feet of space. Uh, that's, that's a lot, I guess. I don't know. A lot for your gear. For all, all your, all your gear. gear. I can bring all my <laughs> tripods and everything. Now, let's talk about the engine, since you care about the engine, too. A standard 3.5 liter V6 engine with 290 horsepower and 255 uh, foot-pounds of torque. Uh, towing capacity up to 5,000 pounds when properly equipped so it can haul a boat, camper, or a trailer. And 
even though you get all that power. Ford's been really great in these newly designed engines. The 2011 Explorer has best in class 25 highway miles per gallon, according to the EPA. Everything from off-road, rugged off-roading, to snow-covered surfaces, that four-wheel drive system, that intelligent four-wheel drive. Boy, this, look at the list of stuff this thing comes with. <laughs> The terrain management system, you can get this, it's a, a turn of the dial lets you say, I'm on normal mud, ruts, sands, snow, gravel, or grass. And then it has a hill descent control that maintains your speed on steep declines. I, w I want For off-roading. I love I this. Yeah. And of course, the My Ford Touch, uh, everybody loves that. We've talked about the sink before. My Ford Touch connects you and your vehicle to the outside world and completely customize it with touch controls and voice commands, entertainment, climate control, phone, of course, and full navigation uh, as well. Which is good because some, some of us you get, get lost. lost a lot? I bet you do. You seem like I've, No, I'm, I'm good with direction. <laughs> I just, I feel like I need GPS to, yeah, to guide help. me. Yeah. We'll help you. <laughs> Check out the 2011 Ford Explorer this week at a dealer near you. And if you want to know more about the 100% reinvented Ford Explorer, visit Mostly Photo Adventures. That's our site for our photo walks. Exactly. We're going to do one on the 26th of uh, March. That's coming up. We've got three in planned in total. We're going to do one in Vegas at the NAB. NAB. I can't wait. We're going to go downtown. The one that's coming up, and probably too late for you, uh, unless you're watching this like live, March 26th, the Ferry Building on the Embarcadero in San Francisco. They've got that great farmer's market, so mm -hmm. you can be able to do that, but you can go in the Ferry Building. I th are you going to walk down a little bit, the bow and arrow there and the oh, bridge yeah, and all yeah. that? It's so cool. That's sort of, those are my haunts. So we've got the Bay Bridge and there's really Now cool we watch your RSVP. There's, it, it starts at 2 p.m. on Saturday and we already have 40 RSVPs. So I don't know how many people we can accommodate, but I want you to go right now to mostly, if, if, if you're seeing this before the 26th, mostlyphotoadventures.com. April 11th, Monday, is our Vegas photo. Again, mostly photoadventures.com. We'll find out more. And we do thank our friends uh, at Ford for uh, the 2011 Ford Explorer, newly 100% reinvented, and our sponsor uh, for our Mostly Photo Adventures. Find out more at mostlyphotoadventures.com. <laughs> All right, that was a long time. I'm sorry. Now, we're <laughs> going to do a project. Let me get this out of the way. Project time. Do I need scissors? What do I need? Well. We've gone to the, we've gone to the hardware store. So let me hold up what we've got here. Um, some double-sided Velcro, sticky back Velcro. Um, that's easy to get. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't get the pointed scissors because <laughs> we wouldn't want you to hurt yourself. That's cool. Um, uh, and so what else are we going to use? So when I was looking at sort of building uh, a DIY diffuser for a point and shoot, you know, I went online, I looked at it, and there's so many different tutorials, and they all include things that you have to get at craft stores and Home Depot. And I live in San Francisco, <laughs> and we have none There's of no those crafts things. There, huh? We have none of those things. <laughs> I have a Walgreens, <laughs> and, you know, I just wanted to find things that I had around the house. And so I've just been to South By. So I have... Yeah, this is your VIP badge. I have a VIP... party. Which, which actually works amazingly well. As so this is stiff plastic. It is. It's stiff plastic, and you can actually, if you pass me my other flash, you can actually use this for, um, for a regular flash as well um, to direct the light. So that could be your bounce? Would, would that be your bounce? Or no, it's more like an amplifier. This is a reflector, so it's yeah. going to, like, it's going to direct okay. the light. But I want to use, I want to do something for, for those of you that have for a the point, point and shoot. shoot. Okay, and this is, I don't know how you're going to do it, because look how, <laughs> look how teeny-weeny, that little teeny-weeny flash there. So, uh, there's a few things that you can have. We have, I have some stickers. Um, this badge, I actually got this from a I. A mini um, iPod. The iPod case. Yeah, for the so they've got the Apple sticker. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could use a shirt cardboard. Does you it have to be bright white or does it matter? Um, it helps. So we're going to use it in a reflective way. So you want something that. We're going to use it to diffuse the light. Oh, so right okay. now we've got a beam that's going straight into your face right. that's going to give you Red hot eye. spots. And yeah. yeah, so what we're trying to do is spread out the light. Okay. Um, so we're looking for things that are somewhat that have that somewhat translucent quality. So obviously the more translucent ah. and the thinner it is, the more light's going to be let through. So the kinds of things you'd like is the backing for the sticker. Yeah. Because you can kind of see through that a little bit. Yeah, so we've I got it. like sticker, you can use wax paper. Um, a business card obviously is, you can use. The thicker, not ideal, yeah, yeah, it's not ideal, but I'm just trying to find every, you know, things that people have. Okay, now what do we do with it? Let okay. me give you the scissors. I think you're going to need that. Right. 
So. I love this. <laughs> You're not going to hurt yourself with these. <laughs> oh, God. I, uh. So what, what I've found is that if you just sort of bend the corner here. Okay. Just a little bit. And I have duct duct tape and if you don't have duct tape then tape you're not tape. you're not a man <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have duct tape <laughs> i just want to point out she has the duct tape and i don't so <laughs> you gotta have duct tape so with this you know we've got a pop-up flash so right. this is a bit different so what i'm going to do Can hold that for you is just sort of stick this on the back okay so and duct tape goes on the back of the bent this is silly. I know. Don't people laugh at you when you go around with something tape? Do they ever say, um, "Lisa, there's something"? It's a big, it's a big ghetto. But it, but it, it, it does works. it does work. So it's now blocking the flash. It's in front of the flash. Right, and so obviously the more flush it is with the flash, the more diffuse the light is. Okay. And then if if you angle it slightly upwards, then you're going to get the, the light slightly angled okay. up. So. You know, on doesn't it the camera get confused because it's not getting as much light as it expects from the flash? Does that hurt um, change no, the shot? No, the only thing you really want to watch for is the autofocus. You don't want to block. Okay, and you'll have to know where that is. It's not always obvious. Yeah, well, in this case, it's pretty if clear. If you pass me that one as yeah. well. So here's a more standard one There's with... A little, it looks like an electric eye, kind of. Yeah, so don't block that or it, it really will be confused. <laughs> oh, God, I'm focused. <laughs> That's something but right next to You me. know, what I did is that I just sort of played around with what angle worked. And then, you know, you can really duct tape that in <laughs> to your camera. Did you actually do this? Well, I did yesterday. Did you? Wow. All right. And, and it, it actually, like, I was you surprised. Get better sh you, get, you get good shots. You do. Because, wow. you know, and I'll, I'll post them on, on my site with, so like, full instructions on how to do this. But Don't be embarrassed that you're walking around with something stuck to your camera. Yeah, why not? I don't know. It's it's crafty. And <laughs> if you do have something that, that looks more like this that's not a pop-up flash, then you can do the same sort of thing, or you can just sort of like... Actually easier, right? You just yeah, tape it right over. Yeah, you can just tape it right over. And the really like a ghetto ghetto way is just getting seller tape and just putting it over your flash. But I think something like this works better. A little more And you can just duct tape yeah. it on. And then another, if you want it to be sort of removable, then you can get something like, um, you know, Velcro that's you can stick. And I actually have this on. I noticed you have a lot of Velcro on your on your flash. I do, and I actually stick on um, so gels. So you have pieces that you'll put on there. Yeah, I have different colored gels. So I'll have like a blue gel or a, you know, and I just actually stick those on to my flash. So if you want it to be sort of removable, and you can get black so that it like kind of blends in with mm -hmm. your camera, and just like you know, instead of duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> they won't know until you put something on it, and then you'll go, hmm. Yeah. Wow, I did notice, though, I have to say, that you have quite a bit of Velcro. I do. Well, I also stick, yeah, I also stick on my um, pocket wizards to them oh, as well. All right. So those, are your, uh, those are the remote controls. That, yeah. yeah. Cool. So, uh, you know, and the, if you search online, there's, there's a million and one different tutorials, but this, like, just takes stuff from around your house. And, you know, they're all sort of standard just get something that's sort of, um, you know, that you that's slightly translucent, that's white, and then use duct tape or Velcro. Great. And there you go. I love it. <laughs> Great tip. And, uh, you know, if you want to buy whatever, like, I mean, you can buy the actual gear. Uh, so people sell these? Yeah. You kits for these? Not kits, but you can buy like the actual device, like a like an Omni Bounce or something. Well, I'm going to show you what I use because I actually did spend money on that. I I couldn't bear <laughs> gluing stuff to my <laughs> flash. It's true. Well, there you have it. Those are all the little things. Do dicky do do. <laughs> Next time you go to a conference, just <laughs> hold on to the conference pass, the doohickeys and doodads mm -hmm. that you can glue to your camera to give you a softer flash. And by the way. Your friends will thank you because the picture will be so much nicer. Yes, exactly. And you won't have to do so much post on shiny foreheads. <laughs> <laughs> we want to get your questions. We'd love to hear from you. We still haven't, I have to apologize, I, my fault, set up the mailbox. So I will set up the mailbox before this show airs. Um, what did we say it was going to be? Mostly photo at twit.tv. I think that's, that's a good address. So I'll set that up. Mostly photo at twit.tv. And mm -hmm. we will have a phone number two. So you can leave your messages. I apologize. I, I, I lagged behind on that.
But uh, we'll have all that for you. You'll find it at MostlyPhotoAdventures.com as soon as we have that number. And I, yeah, ask you've your, got it. You've got questions. I do. I do. I mean, people ask me questions all the time. And um, this came from one of my Twitter followers, Simon Brown. And he asked... What's your Twitter handle? Mostly Lisa. So just Twitter Mostly Lisa. That's easy. <laughs> oh, At no. Mostly Lisa. That's easy. Yeah. No, I, I, do, I do try to reply to all questions. Usually I can't reply to them in 140 characters, but... We'll try to answer them. That would be impressive. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Buy Flash. Do this. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so my uh, question today is, I've been asked by a shopping department store to shoot their catwalk. However, I know the lighting isn't great. Would you re recommend using a flash or cranking up the ISO, resulting in noisier pictures, which we talked about? A bit confusing because some of the people say definitely don't use flash in catwalk, maybe because it washes the colors out and causes white, bright patches on skin and some say do use the flash so how do we so you better define this is this when the models go down the catwalk yeah I and mean they're doing so it's like fashion week kind of yes but I mean obviously we have a different situation when it's in a department store versus like you know the catwalks of Paris yeah when you well, I know when you watch fashion week sometimes you see flashes but most of the time you don't because it'd be annoying to people yeah but I think when you're in a department store you know, obviously, it's not going to be great light. And if you crank up the ISO too high, you are going to get noisy pictures. Right. And I think in this situation, where it is sort of a smaller venue, it is something where you can get closer to your subjects. Now, in, like, traditional catwalks, you have to be really far away. Right. But with this, I feel like you can go up close, and because the department store has asked this photographer to come and take the photos, it is something where you can use a flash. And I really do think that if you dial down the flash so it's not sort of one-to-one, -one where you, know, you dial down the power a little bit um, to maybe one quarter, and then put something you know, like either use the built-in diffuser in your flash or get something like an omni bounce where you can really diffuse the light and don't point it straight at your subject but maybe a little bit out or you could bounce it off but i think y you have to really use like a little bit of flash to sort of fill in because you're going to have you know the harsh sort of fluorescent lights above you but you really want the girls to look good i mean ideally you'd be able to bring in lights and do it right yeah but, you know, I, I remember back in my beginning modeling days when I was sort of, you know, 13, and I did shows like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it really is poor, poor lighting. Right. So, and I'd also recommend, you know, if you're shooting, if you have time to shoot either before and after, take the girls and, you know, pull them outside and do a couple shots outside with them wearing the clothes that, you know, the clients will really appreciate having, you know, shots that aren't right, right yeah, there. And then There's another benefit to that. You'll have a shot with the actual color of the material. In fact, if I were you, I would take a little snippet of the back of the dress and just bring it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but you could no. use these. Just cut a little <laughs> bit off the back of the... But, but he makes a point. You, you want to match the color. You don't want to have a photo come back that it's a red dress that looks purple. Yeah, I mean, and obviously you're, you're dealing with so, like mixed lighting situation. Right. Fluorescents so are green. Yeah. You could have all sorts of weird color casts. In so there. in so that, I mean, it's honestly a case where you just really have to do the best that you can and, and make sure that if, if they're, usually these, these um, department store shows are sponsored by someone. So, you know, if it's like a, you know, washing powder or something like that, you want to <laughs> get that logo in there with the girl. <laughs> I d I've done I these things. Tell. You know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's so funny. And uh, you know, get you know, t do some shots. We take the girls and put them in front of you know the washing powder and get some of those right. shots as well as the catwalk. And and remember to, to take a lot of pictures because when people are moving, especially models, and you know you're not dealing with really pro models, you're gonna get a lot of like bad facial expressions. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> take a lot of pictures. So take case. a lot of pictures, and I really think you should fill with a flash um, in that situation. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you can increase the ISO to something like ISO 400, but don't push it because y you don't want to deal with grainy, right. and you're dealing with white balance issues. Right. And so, yeah, fill it diffusely. You're going to need the flash to, c to cover the bad colors. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Don't just don't point it right 
at their face. Right. Like, make sure that you're diffusing light and it's sort of covering, you know, bigger area. Great. Yeah. Thank you for the question. At Mostly Lisa on Twitter, if you have a question, or email mostlyphoto at twit.tv. Mm -hmm. You can also uh, call our 800 number as soon as we have it, but we don't. <laughs> and it won't be an 800 number, so never mind. So, and um, obviously I want to encourage everyone to get out and shoot, and I think one of the best ways to do this is to go on a photo walk. I think you should go on our photo walk. <laughs> March 26th is the first one at the Ferry Building. We mentioned that, 2 p.m. 40 people have already RSVP'd, so don't waste any time. Go to mostlyphotoadventures.com and uh, check out while you're there the new 100% redesigned 2011 Ford Explorer. We thank Ford for supporting our photo walks. Next one, April 11th in Las Vegas, downtown. And we're going to do that in the evening because they have the great laser light show. This will be a good time to test all this knowledge that you've mm -hmm. got about low light photography. Exactly. And, and for those of you that don't really know what a photo walk is, we actually had the opportunity to sort of jump in on Trey Radcliffe's um, photo walk in so South fun. by Southwest. Now, he is really the master of photo walks. And I've been emailing him and asking for tips on how to make this a really great photo walk because obviously he had... I don't know how hundreds. many, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of photographers, and it was such an incredible experience to see all these people. Some of them just had an iPhone, some of them had a point and shoot, some of them had thousands of dollars worth of camera, Yeah. and it was fun for everybody. And um, so we have a clip from that that Let's we'd like to show you. We all see the same thing, but we all have our own view on it. And then we get home, and the second half of it is sharing. So we all get on Flickr, we look at each other's photos, and it's fascinating to see how everyone else sees the same world. You want, we're going to do a photo walk. Oh, we're going to do a photo walk. I think photo walks are a great place for people to learn about photography and really get a, sort of a community around them. Because when I started out, I literally made friends with photographers all over on Flickr, on Twitter, on Facebook. And that's how I learned how to take photos. Like, yeah. it, it wasn't through traditional means at all. It was through looking at other people's photos and meeting other photographers and asking them how they take amazing shots. And I think having you as as a guide is a perfect is a perfect way to sort of show you know budding photographers where they can really push their photography well so i think we're all learning together right and my number one rule on Flickr is not to leave the comment nice shot all right you've got to say something substantive and photographers are like um we're all actually kind of introverted people. Well, that's what I was going to say. Photography is a solo sport normally. It is, but we have this kind of yearning to be with other photographers. And we collect gear. We're like golfers. But golfers, they get to go to the golf course and play with other golfers and hang out at the 19th hole and just sort of be in that milieu. But photographers don't have that choice. So whenever you have a chance to do a photo walk, it's huge. Everyone comes out. It's great. We just want an excuse to be together. How many people do you have? Well, we started at the Driscoll. We had about 250 seats at the Driscoll, and it was standing room only. So, I don't know, three or 400. We're going to do a count for the world record and see. This might be a world record? Yeah, we took a, a wide-angle photo of the, of, the, uh, of the group, and we're going to send it to this, this body that keeps track of these things, and they're going to count person. But we had each person hold up their camera, so we're going to count the cameras, and that's the official number. Wow. wow. I think one of the most amazing things is, you know, I'm seeing a lot of DSLRs, but I, but I think, you know, Almost anyone can afford a camera. Everyone has a camera in their, in their, in their phone, or you know, and and, wow. <laughs> you got some fans up oh, uh, wow. above you. Hello. Oh, they, they the photo walk is leaked upstairs. <laughs> it is. <laughs> We're like a virus that just slowly takes over. The thing that's neat is uh, is that everybody has to get something a little different, right? So the challenge is yeah. how can I get a different perspective on something everybody else is taking a picture of? Well, that's. What I talked about when we went out is you have areas of really boring government buildings and signs, just not much, and then you have like target-rich environments. The challenge is to find beauty in the mundane. And we all can do it, it takes a little more focus, but that's, that's something photographers like to do. Right. Yeah. What fun. Well, thank you for letting us thank borrow so Trey. Much. We don't want to keep you <laughs> off your photo walk much you're longer. You're losing your light. Go you're grab it. It's the magic hour. Quick, get a picture. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Bye. See you later. Thank you, Trey. Thanks, Leo. It's great to see you. What Thank fun. Thank you so much. Trey Ratcliffe. I loved it when I, you know, they were shouting, Leo, Leo. <laughs> we were up above <laughs> waving down. That was so much fun. What a nice group of people. I felt like they were paparazzi. I was 
And I, I just think it's such a great opportunity um, to learn. Yes. Not only from from the person that's holding the photo walk, but also from other people. And that's how, honestly, I learned most of my stuff because I'm not, I'm not, I didn't take any photo classes or anything. I learned everything from other photographers. And, and just to have someone and say, oh, hey, what settings are you using? Right. And like, oh, I see that you're just using a point and shoot like me. How do you get great pictures? And connecting with them online and sharing your photos on Flickr and sort of commenting. And, and we also have a Flickr group that we'd love you to um, post your photos. It's flickr.com slash group slash mostly photo. No S. Mostly, mostly photo. photo. One of them. Yes. Right. And um, post your pictures and, and comment on other people's pictures and, and really try to learn from each other and, and be encouraging. Yeah. I don't think you really need a teacher or a leader on a photo walk. I know... You know, Scoble is a good photographer, but not a brilliant photographer. He does a lot of photo walks. We know a lot of people who do. It's really a, it's, it's a social event mm -hmm. that encourages you to take pictures. And the best way to get better is to take a lot of pictures. Really, mm -hmm. that's the best way. Yeah, but I like to I'm a, I want to cover some of the things we've already talked about. Um, so I can't I'll wait. I'm, I'm going to miss this first one Saturday, yeah. but I'll be in Las Vegas for April. So I want to do some HDRs and, um, you know, some shallow dip the field. We've got the farmer's market, so we can That'll be cool. take some fruit. Fruit and vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the Bay Bridge, and as you know, I love to take pictures of the Bay well, Bridge. Well, it's your neighborhood, so you've it got is. some great pictures there. I've seen so many beautiful pictures from I you. I do. Can't wait. That's going to yeah. be fun. Mostlyphotoadventures.com to find out more about that. Awesome. So one of the segments I want to do every week is a what's in your bag segment because I personally love to look in photographers' bags. And this last week we did mine, and this week we're going to do yours. And then we'll be done with us, and we'll have real people. <laughs> we'll have real photographers. I, I don't look. I'm, I am just a uh, complete amateur. I love taking pictures, and I have fun with it. And I have to say, part of the reason I'm into it is I love the gear. I mean, that's kind of the fun yeah. of this. <laughs> and uh, you know me. I love gadgets. So I do have a few gadgets. You asked me to bring the stuff that I use for low-light photography. Yeah. And uh, you, we've, we mentioned already most of this stuff. I think the, the number one um, uh, tool I've got is also probably the most expensive tool of the bunch in here, and that is this great low-light lens. I, like you, use a Canon 5D Mark II, really much more camera than I need. And since I hadn't spent quite enough on a... F By the way, that's part of the tool because it has a full-frame sensor. The bigger the sensor, right. it's 35 millimeter sensor, the more light it picks up. So these do very well in low light. As you said, they go up to ISO, really what is it, 64,000? Very high. Uh, get, they get grainy. I would say 3,200 to 6,400 is probably more than enough. Yeah, I mean... You I'm know what the best is that, 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 three, that um, D3 from Nikon? That's an amazing low light camera. I so know, but we're Canon. We're Canon shooters. <laughs> this is the thing I spent. This is my baby. This is what I yeah. spent most of my money on. It's the 50-millimeter uh, lens. I like using a 50-millimeter lens because uh, it's simple. It's a prime lens. That means it doesn't zoom. It's always 50-millimeter. And, and it's such a beautiful lens for portraits. Um, if you're shooting, you know, if you're a new parent and you have, like, for kid photos, baby photos, event photos. Well, and this one... And I went overboard. I, they have a variety <laughs> of f-stops. This is the one of the widest f-stop lenses uh, made, which is an f1.2. And a 1.2 lens, uh, you probably can see this, lets in a lot of light. It's wide open. Um, so this can take uh, uh, shots in very low light conditions without a flash. Of course, as we talked about last week, when you open it all the way up to 1.2, focus is very tricky, very difficult. Do you find that a problem with that lens? You have to focus very carefully. I, but what you get then is, of course, as we mentioned last week, great Beautiful bokeh. Beautiful bokeh, yeah. And uh, it gives, it, it, you know, it really is a way to focus the viewer's attention on a particular mm -hmm. small bit of the uh, shot. It's not great for portraits at 1.2 because, of course, only a part of the face is in focus. <laughs> it's such That's a shallow right. depth of field. <laughs> But uh, I, do, I do love taking pictures in stores and other low-light situations with this 1.2 lens. I just think it's a great mm -hmm. uh, lens. So that's kind of my most important part of my low-light kit. I've already said I don't like flash, but if, if you're going to use flash, this is, a, this is a good one. Scott Bourne told me to get this one. This is uh, a Canon flash. It's the 580 EX2. So that's, this is the big, the big daddy. Um, yeah, and flash. the reason is it's, it's through the lens or TTL metering. Mm -hmm. So what that means uh, is when you attach the flash through the, uh, the uh, accessory connector here, it's talking to the camera and will actually use not its own meter for the brightness, but the, the camera itself, and it will adjust the flash appropriately. 
So what you don't get is big, bright, blown out pictures. This is a great flash for just adding a little fill light, mm -hmm. an appropriate amount of light. And of course, as we showed it, you can bounce it. It's got the diffuser mm -hmm. built in. But I hate flash. And so I got one yeah. more accessory that uh, I've seen wedding photographers use oh, in particular. Oh, yeah, you've got that one. You were mentioning uh, for, for the catwalk shooting. Uh, Gary Fong uh, makes these. Um, it's not very expensive. fits right on the flash. I haven't done it in a while, so I'm not going to do it now because I'd have to stretch the plastic out a little bit, shrunk mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, it's a diffuser dome. You put that mm -hmm. on here, and when the flash goes off, and I'll actually I'll put off the flash, instead of a bright light straight from the source, it diffuses the light throughout the room, right. and you get much more natural lighting. It's kind of a softbox uh, for flash. Yeah. And if you have TTL metering, as we do on this flash, I'm going to fit it on. Oh, see, that's, that's, <laughs> I should have gone. I should have done this before the uh, show. It's been a while since I put it on. And it's shrunk up a little bit. I might have gotten it for a different flash. That might also be. <laughs> it's not quite it does possible. fit. I've used it. But you'll go to GaryFongStore.com to get this. It's about 50 bucks, and they do make them for a variety of flashes. You mentioned tripods. I brought yeah. three. Oh, wow. Yeah, we mentioned the cheap Gorillapod. I'm not a big fan of this. It's very hard to get the Gorillapod just right, but it is cheap. I think it's... I think you can the wrap it around things, which makes it... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, I've seen people on the cruise I know, ship I have, do this. Yeah, I've used it on, on railings and right. stuff. Um, I, I feel like it's, it's a great, if you have, um, you know, entry-level DSLR that isn't that heavy or, um, you know, a point-and-shoot, you can even get one for your iPhone or a mobile camera. Um, but honestly, if... It's hard to get a straight. Yeah. get them straight. To be honest with you, I feel stressed out when my gear is on something that could possibly and and there's a shot that my mom will kill me for. It's a shot on my balcony in Vancouver of my 5D on a gorilla pod on a railing, and she's like, "I can't believe you did that," yeah. but I do. I mean, it is if you work it and you know how to work it. It's it it it's is fairly a, inexpensive. And it's also something you can just carry in your gear because, right. Small, honestly, carrying a tripod can be annoying. Half the time, I leave my flash and my tripod behind, and I just depend on that fast lens. This, you mentioned, is a monopod. This is not a very light one. It's the Manfrotto. Uh, they're a common name. They're not very expensive, but they are pretty heavy. You can see it can mm -hmm. telescope out. I use this for sports photography because uh, it does give you the chance to use a longer lens and have a steadier shot. Mm -hmm. It's also great if you're using the video capability of your DSLR. What you really don't want to do is shoot shaky video. And mm -hmm. handheld DSLR 1080p video just doesn't yeah. look great. So even this isn't, of course, as steady as a tripod. It moves around. But even a monopod it is going to be a you, big, yeah. big improvement. And it's also something that you can use a lot of places, um, you know, museums, art galleries, will not let you in with a tripod, but they'll let you use a monopod. Right, right. Um, train stations, you That's know. It's interesting. So they just don't like tripods, huh? Well, it, it's just the, the hazard, right? Because when you're, you have a tripod, you have the legs out, right. and you could possibly trip someone. When I was in London, I was, in, you know, near the London Eye, and I had my tripod out, and I'm like, it's dangerous. You can't it's use true. it. But I saw someone use a monopod. So, and you can also be a lot sneakier. Right. Like when you've got a tripod, and, you, you know, unless you're a real expert, and you can just, like, get it out, or you've got it out. It. Um, I like this tripod. It has a, a a good tripod or monopod will have a spirit level on it because you you know this especially you don't know what's level. So it's nice to have that. I usually fix that in post. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I try if to get it still, as level as possible. Right. Movie is a little harder <laughs> to fix in post. Yeah. This has a ball head, so you can adjust that head. Although again, with a monopod. Um, Really, the way you adjust it is by moving the monopod. And when you have like a, a plate that releases, you can keep that on your camera and that. then just like yeah. slide it on. It makes it much easier to put the plate on too. You don't have to spin the tripod around and around and around getting the, getting the, the head on. So but again, you know, something like this, it, you know, if you are beginning and it is, you know, it is something that's expensive, you can get a really cheap tripod. And I shot with you monopod, know, yeah. a monopod. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I shot with something really, really cheap, and if you know, if you're using a point and shoot or you're using like an entry level DSLR, it's okay to get something sure. a little bit cheaper. But when you have a really expensive camera, obviously you want something. Well, and I'll tell you the other thing is I've been through a lot of cheap monopods because they bend, they break, 
Yeah, so that's true. So I was glad I spent a little money on the Manf Manfrotto, yeah. and uh, this thing is made of steel. It's robust. Mm -hmm. It's heavier than my tripod, though, because oh, really? I really spent on the tripod. Ah. This is a Gitzo, and it's a oh, carbon. Oh, you have a Gitzo. A car yeah. <laughs> of course you have a Gitzo. Of course I have a Gitzo. <laughs> it's a carbon fiber uh, tripod. You know, Bruce Dale, who's the National Geographic photographer I quote all the time, mm -hmm. is the guy who told me about the Gitzo. Uh, Gitzo uh, uh, and so did uh, Peter Krogh. They both had them. Because it's carbon fiber, they're very light. But this is, there are a couple of things Bruce really liked. One is, these are the releases. You can just spin all three oh. and pull it right out. Oh, so it's that's very nice. fast. Instead we of little, like the latches. We did yeah. little races to see how fast we could set up the tripod. And this thing is amazing because it's basically two, three twists of the wrist and the tripod is extended. The other thing I really like, and different tripods have different ways of mounting the head, but this is a particularly useful head. Uh, Bruce took a lot of uh, panoramas. So he'd have kind of in, yeah. the, in the field, outside, uh, kind of difficult uh, conditions. And, you know, of course, again, you want to sh shoot level. This is a, oh. called a leveling head. It's got a little spirit level on the bottom. And it's very quick and easy to get the head exactly where you want so it. So you don't have, like with a ball head, you have to constantly be like yep. switching around. He yeah. recommended this leveling head. Uh, this is not cheap, probably six or seven hundred bucks compared to the hundred or two hundred bucks you'd spend on a regular tripod. But this thing has been with me almost everywhere in the world. It's, 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 it's an investment. It's a wonderful investment. Definitely. I, I really love my Gitza. So there's my low light uh, technologies. Those are some of the things in my bag. You see I've spent way too much money considering <laughs> the quality of the images I get. But someday I will be a great photographer. <laughs> And, and we'll hope, you know, and, and if not, you can just use some stickers. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, what fun. Thank you for doing this show with us. We really appreciate it. I'm learning a lot. I hope you are, too. Again, if you've got a question for Lisa, you can Twitter her at MostlyLisa. Her website is MostlyLisa.com. Our email address, MostlyPhoto at Twit.tv. And someday we'll have a phone number and you can leave a message for us. Don't forget about the photo walks coming up. You'll find out more about them. Do RSVP, mostlyphotoadventures.com. We thank Ford and Ford Explorer, the all-new reinvented 2011 Ford Explorer for this. And keep support. shooting and sharing your shots. That's a lot of SHs. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. We'll see Bye. you next time. Sometimes we have to just pay attention to what, uh, what we see in the camera. <laughs> she gave me the Linda Blair look. <laughs> <laughs> it almost kept going. Oh, <laughs>